Good morning, and welcome to the CalCloud Government End User Group. I'm the session's host, Robert Schmidt, Agency Information Officer for California Department of Food and Agriculture. So we welcome our audience uh, from over 46 different departments. Right now online, we are web streaming. We have over 100 different people uh, connected through our web stream. Um, and in our audience, um, about 50, 60 people are here now. We anticipate others will be coming in. Like many of, you, many of you, I'm a customer of Department of Technology, but I'm also the executive change champion for Cal Cloud. Uh, as an agent of change, I'm here to help facilitate this new user group, as well as understand customer needs as we transition to this new cloud environment. So I'm gonna cover some brief logistics and do some quick introductions before we get started today. So I'd like to start to my left. Debbie, if you can introduce yourself. I'm Debbie Jackson, and I'm providing project management on the Cal Cloud, and I'm new to the team. Good morning, everybody. I'm Michael Ochoa. I'm from the uh, Customer Delivery Division here at the um, California Department of Technology, and um, I'll many of my peers in the audience today, but um, we hope to give you a really good solution and some good opportunity to learn about Cal Cloud, so thank you for coming. Good morning, everybody. I'm Dave Langston. I'm the uh, branch manager of security management within the Department of Technology. Hi, uh, I'm Greg Kakigi. I am the manager for CalCloud. Okay, um, just some logistics for you. Um, this is a closed meeting for government employees only. If you're a vendor, there's gonna be a future session for the vendor community, and we will invite you to join that at that time. This meeting is being broadcast over the internet through streaming media as well as being recorded, so be aware if you're asking questions, you may be recorded. The restrooms for CDFA are out the door and to the left. I have to remind folks sometimes that the hallway does reverberate, um, so uh, if you talk in the hallway, please keep it uh, low or take your phone call outside, please. Um, we also ask that you silence your phones. Um, and um, we realize being in IT that you're always taking calls, but we ask you to take that outside. Um, being a user group, I do welcome your interaction. Um, there's plenty of time for questions, we hope, and feel free to ask during the session, um, unless a speaker states otherwise. So today's agenda will cover a number of key topics, including the strategy, a description of what the purpose of the user group is, a use case, security, and onboarding. So I'd like now to switch over to Chris Cruz, Chief Deputy Director of Operations at California Department of Technology. Chris will provide an introduction as well, share the mission, vision, and strategy for CalCloud. All righty, thank you very much, Rob. As Rob mentioned, I'm Chris Cruz. I'm the Chief Deputy Director of Operations now at the Department of Technology. I am uh, 52 days, 23 hours, and 42 minutes into my job. So uh, I hit the ground running here, so thank you for that. Um, they say you can't go back home again. It's great. This, I'm an alumni of CDFA. If many of you don't know, I was the chief information officer and agency information officer here. So it's nice to be back in my old stomping grounds. Anyway, as Rob talked about, we have quite an agenda for you to talk really about CalCloud and what we're doing with CalCloud and how we're aligning services to meet business value. You're going to hear more about case studies. You're going to hear about our mission. You're going to hear about the vision and goals that we're driving now to CalCloud really as a what I call a hybrid cloud. Um, not only infrastructure as a service, but platform and software as a service. And we're going to talk about how we're going to leverage the vendor community to bring this in so we can provide an enterprise service offering so you can bring business value to your customers. So lots in the agenda today, lots of detail. Um, as Rob mentioned, uh, we welcome questions. We'll be happy to answer all of those questions. This is really the first kickoff for CalCloud in a series of meetings, but we wanted to attract you folks at the mid and upper level management area and also at the professional series and classification to let you know what we're doing and really what are the T's and C's of CalCloud and how we're gonna build that implementation plan moving forward. So glad you were able to come and, and again to those um, that are streaming, welcome. So really what we're looking at with CalCloud is we're gonna talk about mission, vision, and goal. We're gonna talk about what CalCloud is. We're going to really coordinate and talk about what CalCloud infrastructure as a service is. As you're aware, we have an infrastructure as a service partner with IBM. So what does that look like now? What are some of the changes that we've made in terms of adoption strategy and leveraging best practices and lessons learned as we move forward to really effectuate the right kinds of changes? 
Um, we're going to talk about, as mentioned, the strategy, what's, what, who's using cloud now, as Rob mentioned, the case study that CDFA is going to provide. What is the new levels of security that we're adding into Cal Cloud? So Mr. Langston will be providing an update on that as well. And then what is the onboarding and adoption process for Cal Cloud? We're really taking a strategic approach to Cal Cloud now. This is a line of business. It's being managed just like a project. It will have a rollout perspective to it that I envision for the next two or three years. So we want to be realistic about the things that we can do to ensure that we're going to be successful in onboarding you and developing the right type of partnership as we move forward. So really looking at the mission, we want to offer cost-effective cloud solutions that provide an environment of on-demand access to computing resources and services. So one of the things that we're going to be talking about in the coming days is we renegotiated the contract with IBM. Um, one of the things that we saw in terms of early adoption was some of our rates, we weren't as competitive as some of our, you know, private sector partners as Amazon and others. So we've successfully renegotiated that contract to bring the rates down to ensure that they're consistent and complementary with our other competitors and in some areas better. So once we're able to get that contract sealed, vetted through legal, we're going to start publishing those rates sometime in the next couple weeks. And I think that you'll find those rates really attractive to onboarding and ensuring that one, we're cost effective in terms of what we're doing, but that you're getting more bang for your buck in terms of service delivery and how we're going to be able to move forward. Vision, really to be a catalyst for emerging new vision technology and delivery models by adopting more efficient, available, and secure cloud services for all of our customers. This is really important. We realize that this is a partnership, that we need to have security in place. Security is a big part of the things that we do in information technology. So and securing, relying, and ensuring that our data is in a place where it can be protected is really important. And having data really at a tier three data center that not only has physical security, but all of those aspects covered, and as we continue to reinforce our security footprint, is going to really be advantageous to our customers in this room. Um, as security is a big issue in cybersecurity, we understand what it takes to mitigate those risks. Goals really drive customer adoption of Cal Cloud through new workload and business opportunities. So again, this is a first in a series of conversations and forums with our community to really communicate what we're doing. As mentioned, communicate what the objectives are, what the goals are, what the onboarding process is. If you're interested, how we're going to provide future training and to do so. We want to be very comprehensive in terms of how we lay this out to make it easier on you as a customer to work with Department of Technology, our data center, and our partners to make this successful. The other area too, and I'm going to go into this, is our vendor hosted solutions. Um, we talked about infrastructure as a service, and that's going to be primarily what we're going to talk about today, but also vendor hosted solutions. And us bringing in additional vendor partnerships from the community to look at areas where you have a unique need or skill set. And we're also going to do that because one of our goals is to streamline and leverage procurements whereby today when you submit something through the Department of Technology, we want to be a broker of those services. So if we can use the service request process that's in place today for expenditures and the way that you do business, and we can make software more easily affordable, more easily efficient and accessible through a streamlined procurement process, then we're going to make this more successful. So we're going to lay all of this out for you here in, in the coming slides. So really, what is Cal Cloud? So when we talked about Cal Cloud, a suite of Cal Cloud services offered by Department of Technology. And as mentioned, infrastructure as a service is what we really started off with promoting Cal Cloud when we signed the contract with IBM over a year ago. And so really, that's OS licenses with security updates. We want to provide a cloud infrastructure service. So again, with partnership with IBM, we have this cloud infrastructure service at our state data center. Um, obviously with security updates that you're getting within that service. OS licenses where you have customer managed patching. Customer provided OS uh, customer managed patching as well. So we're providing all of these types of services for you when you come in and take advantage of this service. Um, also as I mentioned, software as a service with vendor hosted subscription ser services. Today we have Salesforce in place, obviously for CRM. We have Clarity which is a project and portfolio management tool that's already in our portfolio. We have Remedy On Demand with BMC that's in the cloud that we're working through, and we're in the process of onboarding Workday. But there's other lines of businesses and functional areas that we want to continue to add into this area. So we're very interested. We've been talking with AIOs and CIOs in the community and wanted also to reach out to you. What are some of the other software as a service that you would like to see within this portfolio? You know, really what we envision is when you go to a restaurant, you look at a menu, right? And you order off that menu. So we can come up with a menu of services, again, that meets your needs, whether it be infrastructure, software, or platform. We want to be that service provider for you one way or another. 
And that's really what we're trying to lay out. So if you have other software as a service vendors or other areas that you can think of that would be attractive to you and your organization, by all means, you know, contact our customer delivery division and your representative or anybody in this room to let us know what, how we can move that forward. And that's really where we want to streamline procurements in the state. So again, it's one-stop shopping that you take advantage of your OTEC process and that we can become a broker of services in that particular area for you, as opposed to you going out and your organization doing ad hoc procurements that sometimes tend to be labor intensive, uh, where you have to go find money within other parts of your organization to make that happy. So again, we want to make sure we're delivering for the community. Lines of business, uh, disaster recovery, so obviously DR is going to be part of this service offering, storage, and then email. We're also working on email right now. So some of you in this room probably have CS mail. Um, we're working towards uh, extending that contract for CS mail and then looking at options to go from 2010 Microsoft Exchange to 2013, but looking at a com other options like the co community cloud with Microsoft and vNext to ensure that we're, again, aligned with what the community needs. You know, we've heard that the community wants Office 365. So how do we, you know, embed exchange into that process? So in the coming weeks and months, you're going to hear more about that as an enterprise initiative that's managed similar to this position of how we're going to promote that and get that into the community and make it easier for you to bring those service offerings into your organization. So a lot to come, very exciting. All right, infrastructure in a private cloud located at the Information Technology Services Department or Office of Technology, OTEC. So really with Department of Technology now, um, Department of Technology was an agency a couple years ago. Uh, the governor realigned it back under government operations to be a department. So um, OTEC, which was Department of Technology Services at one time, is now folded under the Department of Technology. So really, from an organizational perspective, we're one organization now. So OTEC is part of those data services that we provide. So I wanted to make it clear on the organization and governance alignment that we're working on with this department. So really, what is this? It's really a customer-facing portal that provides you with more control of your server environment. Um, provides a scalable environment which allows you to provision or deprovision your, your resources as you wish. And obviously offering rapid provisioning as uh, virtual servers on a pay-as-you-go basis. So as opposed to you buying your own servers here, standing up and supporting those, you could be sharing and provisioning those servers with other departments, thereby bringing down your general costs and maintenance of services. So I think that that's a real advantage as we move forward as a, as a transformational item for technology. Reduces or eliminates the need for capital expenditures. So in other words, the refresh cycle. Uh, lowers costs than physical server environments. Obviously, within our data center, we're very efficient on how we expend energy. We're pretty good on distribution. And if we can provision services as you need those for data, then you're going to pay for that as opposed to having a sunk cost of that virtual server being in your data center today and maybe not taking advantage of full utilization and, and capacity. Includes options such as increased storage, uh, RAM, disaster recovery, and backup capability. So I manage technology well. I guess I just don't use it very well, so I apologize. I'm trying to get used to this. So, all right. So as we talked about, really one of the things that we've come up with is a strategy. And what we're going to show you really is a one-pager that's a synopsis of all of the virtualization and visualization that's going into Cal Cloud, and really what it takes to, to not only implement a successful project, but implement a series of services that we know we can count on, and it's really stable for you to take advantage of. So we've come up with a Cal Cloud strategy that talks to the mission, vision, and goals of what we're trying to accomplish here what cloud service offerings that we're moving forward with, as we just described, what are the state and local beneficiaries to those particular services, what are the customer benefits that we see in moving towards Cal Cloud and what I call a, a hybrid cloud, uh, adoption strategies, both short-term and long-term, because uh, we understand with adoption that it's just not move everything to the data center tomorrow. There's time frames, there's complexities built into that, so we have, that's why we have project management services in place now, because we need to be able to scope work appropriately um, when there's interest to move things to ensure that we're successful and that we have your resources working with ours and the partnership to make it, uh, make it implementable. We understand that there's risk in things that we do. So it's not a one-size-fits-all approach, but it's a, what I call a phased implementation approach of how we're going to do services here and adopt and move folks into the cloud environment. 
You're going to look at a technology roadmap that we've developed so you'll understand how are we going to get here from there. It's not a build it and hope you will come, but it's really a strategic perspective to say here's the things that we need to do. So a lot of analysis, a lot of lessons learned and best practices have gone into the structure and approach that I'm going to share with you. Also to organizational change management and really how that's important to this process. You know, the people side of change of what's going to happen with Cal Cloud? What are, how, how am I going to reallocate resources or how am I going to use my resources differently in my organization today based on Cal Cloud tomorrow? So we've really thought of the people side of change too and we're going to factor that into this project as well, as well and talk more about that both today and in the future. And then really what is the governance framework and how are we structuring this project? You know, we need to have a communication and vehicle in place to, to communicate and deal and, and, and enhance with the community. So you're going to see a governance structure that's in place in terms of communication with our vendor partners, with our state customers and constituents, um, with our county and local government partners and municipalities. So we're going to give you a description of what that's going to be as well. So really here it is in a nutshell. I know it's probably hard to read obviously on the screen because the graphics are really hard and I don't have my glasses on today. But this is really what I just described to you is really the Cal Cloud strategy. Because one of the things I've learned through the years of both being in private sector and public sector, if you provide too much detail, it's probably not a good thing. So we wanted to lay out really what the strategy was for any, any one pager that lays again the vision, the talks to goals, the talks to our adoption strategies. And, and one of the things that we're looking at within the adoption strategies, and I think we're going to provide you with copies of this before you leave. So Rob Schmidt has them at the table, so you'll be able to see this. Is We wanted to look at what low-hanging fruit are. So when, when you look at the adoption strategy in the right corner, maybe on the left side, according to your screen visual, you'll see that these, this is the short-term short -term strategy that we're targeting. So Windows 2003 servers, uh, Windows refresh migration, looking at tools, um, developing tests and server uh, and development environments, uh, new business, and then integrate additional uh, vendor hosted solutions providers. In other words, add on additional vendors that you might be able to take advantage of that can provide software as a service or platform if that's your particular organizational need. So those are the things that we're looking at in terms of early adoption, the low hanging fruit, because we understand with the 2003 servers that Microsoft's not going to maintain or support those beyond the one year increment so that you know, like the clock is ticking on those particular things. So we can take advantage of it by repurposing those servers and putting them into our cloud environment and then help you upgrade appropriately. So we want to talk more about that. So again, there's a lot of thinking and strategy that's gone into this in terms of how we can effectuate the right kinds of changes that can provide high reward and low risk as we move things forward. So that's really important in terms of adoption. The governance framework is just to let you know that we have a Department of Technology. We're working on, obviously, the director components of that. We work directly with your agency information officers or your respected agencies and also key CIOs and onboarding them into this decisionary making process. So there's a uh, a component where they can give feedback on what they need to do or what they want to see in the terms of enhancements and what, how we're moving forward with this particular model. Uh, we have an Enterprise Leadership Council, really, that's uh, with other CIOs that, again, talks about what are we doing right, what are things that we need to be doing better. We've now adopted an IT Customer Advisor Council of folks that are early adopters of Cal Cloud, so we can lessen how can we make the necessary changes to the infrastructure as a service portal so it's meeting your needs. Portal stability, ensuring that you can provision services on the fly, that we have applicable uptime for the services that we're doing. So that group is advising us on new requirements or requirements that we need to do to address any defects within the portal application that we've stood up. So I think that we're putting the right processes and change control in place because we know that that's really important. And as we onboard more customers into this tool, we need to be able to manage that effectively and efficiently and give you the idea of what's happening within that structure. Uh, customer benefits, I think we visited those. I've talked about really about change management. It's really about people and processes that enable effective technology. That's really what we're trying to do here is make sure we get everybody aligned with uh, the services that we're providing, that we have a clear, you have a clear understanding of what these services are, you understand what the adoption strategy is, as how we move forward, that you're really involved. So, you know, I apologize ahead of time. We're going to probably over-communicate to the community about what we're doing, but I believe it's better to over-communicate than to under-communicate and not communicate at all. So you'll definitely hear more about this and the things that we're doing as we roll this out. Um, the technology roadmap, again, talks about how we're going to get there from here. So we'll be sharing all of this documentation with you as we move it forward and publish it. 
Um, we have a SharePoint site that we're working on right now. Eventually, we'll probably open that up um, as we get more adopters in and, and users so you have access to all the information. Training is going to be a big component as well. So as we move forward, you know, if you're interested in Cal Cloud, well, how do you get there from here? What are the things you need to do with the Department of Technology to initiate a service? And so we're going to provide training on how you do that, all the way from, you know, level one to level eight in terms of what those steps are. So you clearly understand what the process is, and there's no confusion about, well, I'd like to do this, but I'm not clear on what the communication protocol is. So those will be coming in the upcoming weeks about how to do that and as we move forward with more forms to make sure we have the right target audience in those discussions. As well, too, we've talked about cloud cloud services. Again, belabor the fact here is we're really looking at other vendor-hosted solutions to be a part of what I call the hybrid cloud. So again, when you think about Cal Cloud, think about it as a hybrid cloud that's more than just infrastructure as a service at the data center, but leveraging other services that our vendor community can also bring into play, too. You know, we think this can be very successful as a partnership, and the more folks that we get in the boat and the more that we communicate about enhancements and reinforcing what we're doing, the better off that we're going to be. And last but not least, one of the things, too, I wanted to talk about in terms of that is reinforcing, again, our security fo footprint and how important that is. You know, there has been a recent security audit in place that's going to come out that really talks about moving our services to a more enhanced and reinforced security environment structure, and that's what we're doing with CalCloud. And you'll be hearing more about that shortly. So who is using CalCloud now? So here's some of our early adopters within CalCloud that we talked about in terms of some of the services. Just wanted to give you a description that we continue to onboard more customers as we move forward. So adoption is picking up. We believe adoption will pick up even further now as we explain the processes, understand what you need to do from a customer perspective to make the pricing more competitive as we're doing and publishing those rates that will get more adoption. And as we get more adoption, that should drive long-term rates down because we can distribute maintenance in some areas as we talk about in terms of partitioning. So, you know, it gives you an opportunity to be more efficient and effective as a business. So, again, we continue to meet with partners and I invite you to reach out to some of these early adopters to find out, you know, what their experience has been with CalCloud. And again, I know CDFA is going to provide an overview of that shortly. But just to get an idea of what they're doing, how they're using the services, what they like about the services, and, and really what we need to improve with the services. You know, let's be transparent about the things that we're doing. Because we want this to be successful the state of California, not only for our state partners, but also for our cities and counties and municipalities. Because we have a data center, and, you know, let's take advantage of the capabilities that we can do with newer technologies so we can be innovative and transform transformative as a state. Okay. So now I'm going to reintroduce Rob Schmidt as the agency information officer. He's going to take you through the case study and uh, walk you through pr the particular processes. And then I think once Rob's done, he's going to introduce Mr. Langston, and he's going to talk about our security components and capabilities, and we'll get into the nuts and bolts of things. So before I, I exit the, the podium, is there any questions of, of me? All righty. Well, I'll make myself available again after the, 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 uh, the forum as well for any questions. So thank you very much. Rob? So hello again. Um, so I'm going to talk briefly about this user group and why I'm doing this. Just some background is um, I, I've been talking here at CDFA about my strategy, um, and I've, I've, it's become my mantra. So my strategy here at CDFA for technology is social mobile and analytics riding on the cloud wrapped in a layer of security. Uh, and it's something that I repeat often. Um, if you ask any of my staff uh, what we're doing with technology, they'll probably relate to that. Um, and so when I was offered this opportunity to work with Cal Cloud and, and be an early adopter, I jumped on it. And why? Because really cloud is the future of technology in the state. Um, I, w I would like to see resources best spent as where they should be, and that is on business driving business value in the organization. So as we're developing uh, this user group, uh, some of the things that, that have come up that um, that I want to align with is first is understand this user group is at the tactical level. As Chris just shared, we have a strategy now for Cal Cloud, and we're going to drive forward with that. But to make that happen, we know these things happen at um, the manager level and the technical manager level. That's how things get implemented, and that's something that I have expertise in. Also, we want to ensure that Cal Cloud achieves its implementation roadmap. Um, we're talking initially about 500 servers. Um, that's a lot of work to do. 
Also recommend CalCloud requirements. I think this is particularly exciting for our group, um, the folks that are here today, and I look to um, talk with you in the future about what needs you see in your organization, not just technical needs, but business needs. So as we're talking about potential SaaS solutions, not necessarily specific products, but target areas we should be looking at. For CDFA, we're already working with Salesforce. We were one of the first adopters of Salesforce for what I call constituent relationship management. I see a great value there, not just for CDFA, but for many departments that work with the public. Next is to enhance Cal Cloud visibility while managing implementation risk. And finally, as Chris shared, communicate the organization's cloud strategy to government, business, and IT leaders. Um, I too hope to over communicate about Cal Cloud. Um, I want everyone to understand the issues, the risks, and the opportunities that are out there. So as part of this user group, we have some responsibilities. Um, we're looking for everyone to be a change champion within their own agency, to share the information. Um, second is to align tactical IT implementation with IT strategy. Most departments have an IT strategy in place. For mine, it's a four-year plan that we started in 2013. And IT um, is also responsible for the business strategy in our organization. So uh, I have the pleasure of implementing 44 um, different um, 44 different initiatives simultaneously here at CDFA, many of which have an IT component. So I take that as an opportunity at the tactical level. Then is to assess business impact of moving IT services to the hybrid cloud. And that is understand that Cal Cloud is not just infrastructure as a service, that it's really a hybrid cloud and there, there's many different opportunities we have within that. Um, and that's what I seek from you is, what are the requirements that you have? So I'm gonna share a story about Pierce'sDisease.org, but before I do that, I'm gonna introduce two people. If they would stand up, Joe Kelly and Sean Ellis. Uh, so Joe Kelly is the CDFA Manager of Application Development, and Sean Ellis is an application developer within our organization. I think he's come to our organization within the past year or so. And um, they will be sp uh, speaking briefly um, about um, the opportunity they've had with this application and moving it to the cloud. Um, and uh, they'll also be available afterwards for questions. Um, I think it's particularly important because our audience is really a mix of developers, security, infrastructure, and I'm sure there's many questions. Thank you. So let me tell you about Pierce's disease. Um, how, many, how many of you heard of Pierce's disease? I see a few folks from CDFA or maybe former CDFA staff that have heard of it. Um, and it concerns the wine industry. So basically it's a bacterial disease that attacks grape vines that's spread by insects known as leaf, leaf hoppers. Um, it's been present in California for over 100 years and in the past has caused significant losses to the industry. Uh, many people don't realize that the, the wine grape industry is over $4.4 .4 billion industry per year with a total economic impact of over $61 billion to the wine industry. So it's of grave concern to them. In fact, as you drive into Napa Valley, look up uh, as you're pulling into Napa at the signs which says, be weary of the, um, this particular disease. Um, <clears throat> there's no no cure for the disease, but there are controls that we have uh, within industry to help mitigate it. Um, and so we're constantly on the, uh, on the prowl for this disease and these leaf hoppers. So we formed this website back originally in 2007 in cooperative with the um, UC Davis. And it was referred to as the Public Intelligence Property Resources for Agriculture. It was actually developed by a student at the time, developed in a language we had no knowledge of when we inherited it on an operating system we've never worked with. So we basically used that as our as-is state. Um, we developed a 2B model, uh, and our developers um, leveraged what they had out there and developed an entirely new system in the system that we would understand, C-sharp.net web on the SQL Server backend. Um, that's pretty much our standard for our organization. We're a medium-sized organization, and our shop is pretty lean in terms of programming, uh, so we uh, focus on that. In 2014, um, we modernized the platform, and then we rolled it out initially internally to make sure everything worked. But then we had the opportunity to work with CalCloud, and as I shared earlier, 
um, our strategy with cloud computing, uh, we jumped on that. And so our developer team was actually the ones who rolled this out, which is highly unusual. It's more of the DevOp model um, that they'll talk about. Um, and the application was, was uh, about the same as rolling out an internal environment. The same kinds of issues, firewall ports, um, making sure and testing everything before we go live. We did a soft rollout that they'll talk about. Um, and then um, the interaction with the user community. So our user community is over 200 different scientists from around the country. Um, these are folks that are very focused on this particular disease. Um, and as I shared, it's a critical site for them. Uh, it's the way they share information on grants in this area, the way they share um, research that's been conducted and the research results. Um, so you can think of it as a community app. And why did we choose this app, you wonder? Well, it was self-contained. Um, it was a two-tier model, which is typical for our organization. And I think most importantly, when you're first piloting something, you have to think of an application that if it were down, would you get a lot of phone calls on it. And this wasn't one of those applications where we anticipated we get a lot of calls on. It's not, it's not something that we use transactional. There's no, uh, there's no money collected through this system. It's not a revenue generator for us. But it's something that is important enough to the organization that we can put it through a true test. And two is understand that um, since people externally are posting to this or posting information, we get a true test of what CDFA is. It's really a collaborative model of agriculture. Uh, so that was important to us. So traditionally, IT would have gone out and bought equipment. Um, many of you are familiar uh, with buying yet, yet another server in our environment, yet loading yet another operating system, yet loading yet another SQL server. But that's not the case with cloud. Uh, with cloud is we're leveraging an infrastructure that's already out there. We don't need to buy it. We're basically renting it. Um, so for us, um, in terms of it's as simple as just issuing a service request, we get approval to proceed internally. So there's three or four people internally that have to approve the request, including myself for the financial aspect. They launch a virtual instance. Um, and really what this is about is um, changing to a different model of how you manage your server environment. Your server isn't physically there, it's in the cloud but how you manage that is different. It's through um, a virtual interface, essentially. So now we can leverage what we have in terms of our developers who are really empowered to do the job they're supposed to do, and that is develop apps that drive business value for the organization. So now we're online with Cal Cloud Infrastructure, and we're pleased to share that. So I'd like to uh, offer for a moment for Joe Kelly or Sean if they would share from the, the DevOps perspective of what they experienced. So Joe's going to take the mic in the center of the room. This way? No, just that. You can turn it around. Go, Grog. I know. <laughs> I'm Joe Kelly, um, Chief of Application Development here at Food and Agriculture. Um, first of all, I want to thank the DevOps, uh, I mean the, uh, oh, sorry, the CalCloud team. Um, They've been extremely responsive to us. We've been very happy with them. Um, I'm not uh, being paid by Chris anymore um, to say this stuff. We um, were jumping on Cal Cloud of our own volition, um, and we're thrilled with it. Uh, to give you an example, uh, I just asked Sean, who's my head of my DevOps team, uh, you know, how many, uh, how many apps have we converted? Well, <clears throat> Pierce's was the first one. Sean goes 17. So we've got 17 times that much. Uh, jaw dropping, Rob? Yes, I, See, I didn't I, know this. We can't keep up with it. Um, we started off with two uh, servers, 90 gigs. By the way, the smallest servers you can get from Chris and his guys are, are smoking faster than, than our our, our old standard big stuff and the uh, our SQL server is just crazy smoking fast so we're really happy about that we started off with the baby Cal Cloud servers two of them 90 gigs we've already burned through 80 something gigs on one of them doing these conversions so it's sort of like hey you know we need some more space oh well open a ticket you know it's that easy now so 
um, we're, we're, we're really we're really happy with it um, and again this is this isn't push this is pull we 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 really think this is a good model DevOps uh, allows us to get our hands essentially in there and uh, uh, you know, it gives your developers more control over the over the environment, and um, they, they really really like that. The other thing I'd like to say is that, um, you know, ten years ago, every little dot com had servers in a closet. Um, that's that's history, um, and really having servers sprinkled all over the state, you know, you guys can see the future. This is the future. Um, there's huge benefits for it. Um, and if, if anybody would like to get a hold of either me, Joe Kelly, or Sean Ellis here at CDFA, shoot us an email. We'll be glad to, to, to uh, assist you guys from the, you know, from the user standpoint. Thank you, Joe. Um, I did leave my business card in the back, and also, too, I'll leave in the back the Cal Cloud strategy document in legal size, very easy to read. Um, and feel free to contact me if, uh, or Joe Kelly directly. Um, we'll be happy to answer your questions. So I'd like to um, ask if, for a moment if there's any questions from our live audience at this time. No? Um, we're going to proceed on then to David Langston, Branch Chief Security Management, California Dep Department of Technology. He's going to talk about the Cal Cloud security, both from an infrastructure as a service perspective and the general perspective. Okay, good morning everybody. Um, I see a few familiar faces out there, but uh, for those that I haven't had an opportunity to meet uh, up to today, uh, again, I'm Dave Langston. I'm the branch chief of the security management branch within the Department of Technology. And a little background for me relative to CalCloud. Uh, I basically go back nearly three years in what is now called the CalCloud uh, IAS and the full CalCloud process. Uh, project or program uh, uh, back in kind of the, the, the idea time frame of Cal Cloud and moving it forward. Uh, uh, we did uh, uh, an RFI, there was an IFB, we went through that entire process. And the entire process of getting to where we are today with Cal Cloud has been um, really focused on bringing uh, capability that meets the security requirements of the state of California. And that's my intention to try to communicate to you today uh, how we've done that, where we are, and what you can expect if you come into the Cal Cloud environments. Um, with that, a um, couple of uh, acronyms on this uh, page. So I'd like uh, a show of hands. How many people in the audience know what the acronym NIST stands for? Okay, fewer than I might have expected, so let me explain that. NIST is the National Institute for Standards and Technology, and it's the body within the federal government that sets standards for the IT, uh, uh, for federal government and IT. Um, if you're familiar at the federal government of a program called FISMA, all government agencies are required to uh, uh, configure and operate their IT infrastructure according to standards that are published by NIST. And NIST has a document that's called 853, which is the set of controls that all federal agencies are required to conform to. And that becomes the basis for another acronym you'll see on this page, which is FedRAMP. FedRAMP is the program that the uh, federal government has stood up to uh, uh, standardize and create a set of requirements for what cloud providers must uh, be able to provide when a federal agency goes into the industry or when a cloud infrastructure is stood up. And so if you're a federal agency, FedRAMP is the program that essentially defines what your vendor or what your cloud service has to conform to to be able to put federal data into the FedRAMP uh, uh, or into that cloud situation. Um, so as a result, um, our intention with CalCloud all along was to conform to these standards uh, as well as 
making sure that CalCloud uh, was conforming to the requirements of the state of California, which is obviously in SAM and SIM. And if you happen to look through uh, the state administrative manual, section 5300, you'll see references to NIST in literally every section of SAM 5300. So that's the relationship between SAM, NIST, and FedRAMP. FedRAMP really is the implementation of the NIST standards for a cloud infrastructure. So within Within CalCloud, not only for CalCloud IaaS or, or infrastructure, which we're talking about uh, primarily today, but for the entire CalCloud family of services that the Department of Technology is planning to offer, we're really looking at those standards as being the foundational requirements for any service that would be offered as part of CalCloud. And our obviously our intention is to ensure that vendors conform to uh, those security practices. So let's talk about the information as a, uh, as a service uh, and what the security goals were there. And you'll see these align very much to what I've already said, is to provide a service that is equally or more secure to that which can be provided by a physical de dedicated infrastructure. And I hope I can communicate that to you today uh, in kind of high level terms. Obviously to support because of the needs of the state, both mission critical and non-mission critical systems, and that provide an infrastructure that can meet the operational and compliance requirements of the state and the agencies that would take advantage of CalCloud. So in kicking off those ideas, let's talk a little bit about policy. CalCloud, the infrastructure as a service, is really based on what I've uh, shown here as a pyramid of policy which uh, really at the highest point is driven by state policy. And then from that state policy, we add to it policy is required by the Department of Technology, as well as policy that's required by our data center standards and additional standards that we've brought to, uh, to bear as far as CalCloud uh, infrastructure from CalCloud standards themselves. And then as you, as a customer, come into the CalCloud environment, obviously you're going to bring your own policy to how you utilize it, such that your application really um, uh, benefits from the policy contribution of all of these levels. And uh, I think that's important to understand that, that there's a lot of contribution to the security policy that's going on within CalCloud. So let's look at that in another way, in kind of an inverted model. If you bring an application into the CalCloud Cal infrastructure, you gain the benefit of that being hosted in a Department of Technology data center and all of the tier three and other types of benefits that uh, come with that uh, uh, situation. Uh, in addition, uh, layered on top of those benefits, we bring uh, IBM, who is the vendor for the CalCloud infrastructure, and the Department of Technology security controls. And IBM has an entire security control program that's referred to as ISEC, or Information Security, which are part of that stack of controls that are provided uh, as, uh, uh, as part of CalCloud. And it's not just the controls. The ISEC program really is the processes by which those controls are implemented, monitored, updated, and assured. Then on top of that, and in addition to that, we bring in the federal standards, which I spoke to earlier, that really use those processes uh, uh, to enforce those within the CalCloud infrastructure. And it was always the intention of CalCloud infrastructure to be able to serve the needs of uh, uh, state agencies and other governmental agencies. And we're aware that requires conformance to HIPAA requirements, IRS requirements, Social Security uh, uh, Administration requirements, PCI requirements. And compliance to those standards are available uh, through CalCloud. Uh, and if you think about it, because uh, uh, at least all but the PCI standard there are really federal programs. And if you look at the requirements around those, foundational to all of them, uh, within a cloud infrastructure would be FedRAMP compliance. So as I've said, 
what are the security controls? Well, foundationally, uh, the controls uh, are based on IBM's uh, information security processes and control set, uh, that experience in FedRAMP uh, version two. Uh, well, that translates to uh, approximately 325 controls that are applied to CalCloud and assessed against the 25 technical domains that make up the cloud infrastructure for CalCloud, uh, the CalCloud infrastructure environment. With that, uh, it provides a foundation to provide compliance to other authorities such as IRS, HIPAA, et cetera. And it's our intention that uh, as customers come on board and they're interested in understanding this, that they, uh, uh, that we can share with you the controls and the state of the control environment within CalCloud. Now, I'm sure you can imagine that, um, that we don't want to just give people our security controls and have that out uh, circulating in the public. So our requirement would be that you come to uh, uh, the Department of Technology, you sit down with us, and that we can review the controls with you. But that's an important thing to understand uh, the implications of that because, again, if you go back to the state administrative manual and the requirements that are in SAM today, you have to put in place a security program for all the applications you have as state agencies. Um, what you would be able to do then is within that, those security programs essentially inherit the controls that we're providing you as part of the CalCloud infrastructure. And once you understand what those controls look like and what controls we provide within the infrastructure, when you create that system security plan as required by SAM, you essentially say, well, for this control, we're inheriting it, <clears throat> excuse me, from uh, the Cal Cloud and the Department of Technology. And you don't have to inf uh, create that control and enforce that control yourself as you come into Cal Cloud. Um, Another element that I'd like to um, share with you about CalCloud, because in the next slide, we're going to talk about some of the features uh, uh, from a security perspective and, and benefits that you get from CalCloud, is for those of you that are familiar with information security, the, the, the highest tenant of information uh, security is called CIA, Confidentiality, Integrity, and Availability. And within the CalCloud infrastructure, the entire architecture and design has been around uh, delivering those key uh, elements. Confidentiality in the way that the infrastructure is segmented and zoned so that as a tenant you come into the environment and you get your own security zone. Integrity in the fact that all of um, CalCloud is really operated as a high availability environment. So should something happen that requires a, uh, 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 a restart or, or uh, uh, a situation where a workload needs to be moved from one uh, uh, area of CalCloud into another physical area of CalCloud, that's supported automatically within the infrastructure. And then um, from availability, the same sort of thing uh, in that it's highly available uh, as well as uh, part of the architecture is the ability to provide built-in DR to the infrastructure. <clears throat> you have to subscribe to that service, but it's, it's a built-in capability of the CalCloud infrastructure, which you don't have to go stand up some separate uh, DR site and deal with all of the issues, uh, communication issues and other types of, of infrastructure level issues that it would require to stand up a DR capability. So if we look at the key elements that CalCloud provides from a security perspective, you're going to see a number of items here. I've uh, listed about 15 and this is just a sampling of some of those. I'm not going to read through all of these, but I want to point out that um, as you uh, interact with the CalCloud portal, for example, you are utilizing an encrypted two-factor authenticated session. <clears throat> so should somebody's um, credentials be compromised in some way, 
um, because of the two factor, it helps protect against those kinds of events. Um, there's a great deal of infrastructure hardening that goes on in the environment. Um, there's a lot of coordinated process between the vendor and the department of technology around security incident handling, change control, et cetera. Um, the vendors are all subject to not only FedRAMP controls, but state security controls uh, as evidenced by the fact that they have to be background checked. They have to do, uh, they all have to receive uh, uh, security awareness. Um, and that security awareness in, a, in our support of IRS, for example, has to include the IRS uh, required training elements for all individuals that uh, administer an environment that has IRS data in it. So if you read through these, you're going to see there, there are a lot of elements that people are looking for when you're dealing with security in an IT infrastructure. So uh, I've got a couple other slides, but I kind of wanted to pause a moment and just ask if there are any questions about anything I've presented so far. Yes. So um, I, from my perspective, uh, it depends on the type of reporting and the type of element that you're talking about. By the way, the, the question was, uh, uh, would a customer get any of the reporting? Um, the answer is yes, potentially, but it depends on the kind of element you're talking about. Some of it comes in the form of the control that we provide and that you would just inherit. Uh, for example, lease privilege. Well. That's a control that we provide as part of the infrastructure, and you inherit that element from us. So I'm not sure that's a particular uh, 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 reporting element. But things like logs, uh, we would work with you to ensure that you get logs of the virtual machines and the environments that you would place within the environment. That would be something that you could come into the CalCloud environment and, and acquire those kinds of, that kind of information. And, uh, uh, as um, Chris had on one of his early slides, there's different levels of types of, of support that is available through CalCloud. And I would like to uh, submit that you think about CalCloud as offering services that start at something like uh, tenant managed services in the cloud where you come in and you would really uh, configure the environment in the way you want up through uh, patching and other kinds of services being provided to you. So it really comes down to the kind of service that you want to operate and then us coming to an understanding of what the specifics around that would mean. Any other questions before I move on? <coughs> Excuse me. So moving on, kind of CalCloud then and now. Um, FedRAMP has gone through a couple of versions uh, and we're now at version two. And this brought an entirely new level of required uh, continuous security monitoring for uh, cloud environments. And as a result of that, to really meet the requirements of FedRAMP version two, the way that is being, th that continuous monitoring uh, requirement is being met is we've engaged with AT&T security services to provide the monitoring for CalCloud. That includes elements like SIM uh, and log aggregation, vulnerability management, uh, and scanning, uh, other controls. There are roughly 20 controls within the FedRAMP infrastructure or FedRAMP control set that deals or is affected by uh, continuous monitoring. Uh, the advantage of using AT&T services for this is AT&T is already in the environment. Uh, AT&T is a partner with IBM and provides networking services to IBM for the CalCloud infrastructure. So they are a natural partner to uh, engage with for these services. And our target is to be able to have completed the FedRAMP version two uh, control set assessment and be able to share that uh, with customers who are interested in doing so beginning in September of this year. Uh, and we're basically, we have copies of draft versions of the system security plans, 
the plans of actions and milestone and the other artifacts that are required out of uh, uh, the FedRAMP control set and, and requirements set uh, that are being reviewed and, and finalized at this time. So how does that compare to, you know, the, the progression of CalCloud uh, uh, within this security monitoring and security space? Well, in the first half of 2014, we began our engagement with IBM to ensure that we put in place the security control processes. As I mentioned earlier, this is based on their ISEC program, and that basically uh, was foundational to standing up all of the control environments to CalCloud, and that was the focus of the first half of 2014. And then in the second half of 2014, we began engaging on implementing FedRAMP. But in the process uh, between contract and, and the second half of 2014, um, the federal government had upgraded the FedRAMP program to version two, which added uh, dozens of additional controls and, and really tightened up a number of controls and an example of that was the security monitoring requirements that I mentioned earlier. So as we were going through the process of implementing version one of FedRAMP in 2014, second half, we realized that that wasn't really sufficient to the task that we needed to move our focus. And, and the, the original intention was always to move to version two, but the intention or, or the plan was to implement version one first and then do version two. But because of the timing and, and the amount of effort to do that, uh, we essentially changed that in midstream, and we began focusing on implementing version two FedRAMP, which is uh, what we've been working toward to this date. So um, uh, we're, as I mentioned earlier, at the point in time where we're very close to uh, being able to state that we're FedRAMP compliant, uh, very close to the point where we'll be able to share that with customers like yourselves. And I really view CalCloud um, as being an environment that's as secure as any other environment um, that you would stand up in a, a multi-tenant infrastructure, be that a physical infrastructure or a virtual infrastructure like a cloud infrastructure. So with that, any final questions before we move on about security? Yes. Yeah. Talk about compliance of the standards within, within the plan to be certified? Um, at this point, no. Not to say that we might not consider that in the future. But FedRAMP compliance, and the question is around FedRAMP certification versus FedRAMP compliance. The typical way that a cloud service provider gains FedRAMP certification is in partnership with a federal agency. And it, 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 it's sort of a sponsorship and a joint effort between a federal agency and a cloud service provider to, to, to acquire that initial certification. Since we're not federal agencies and we don't have access to the resources that they do, our target uh, was always to achieve FedRAMP compliance and be able to produce the same documents that are created out of that but not to do an actual uh, or FedRAMP uh, compliance, but not actually to do a certification. Now, uh, this is just Dave Langs's opinion. As we move forward, we know that uh, the federal government constantly changes what they require of the states, and there may be a day where they say, if you want to put federal programs in the cloud, it must be a federally certified program. I would hope that they would bring along uh, elements of how that program would work for the state, and we would be able to subscribe to that. Any other questions? All right. So I'd like to introduce Michael Uchoa. He's the account director uh, within our customer delivery division, and uh, he'll take care of you now. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I know a lot of people here. Um, I just wanted to introduce myself again. As David said, I'm Michael Ochoa. I'm the um, account director, or one of the account directors of many in my group that manage all state agencies. So um, we are basically, uh, my role as customer delivery is to be the gateway to OTEC services like CalCloud. So with that said, um, one of the things that Chris mentioned was about the rollout of what we might be offering in CalCloud versus um, CalCloud as an infrastructure or CalCloud as vendor-hosted solutions. And as you work with your account leads, 
every one of you have one, um, you can engage them on questions about how do I get a vendor hosted software contract or I'm interested in, my department's interested in this software product versus another one. They can connect you and start the conversation to see how we can get that going for you. So um, with, with some of that said, um, I also wanted to mention, um, I'm going to show you a little bit about onboarding today. But that onboarding discussion, I'm really focusing on infrastructure as a service. And what I mean by that is, as um, a lot of my peers work with you and your, and, and your um, application development or maybe your networking managers to determine if CalCloud is a viable option, um, one of the things I get is, how long does it take? So I'm trying to address that question to you today. So if you're interested in coming into CalCloud and you want, for example, to stand up a server, I, I really like the, um, what, where's Rob? Oh, there you are. I really like what, what you mentioned for your, um, for your model, for your Pierce's um, disease website coming in, because that was a really good business case to bring in a quick win into CalCloud that doesn't have a lot of complexity. And that's really what this chart is showing here. I know it's kind of hard to see, so I'm just going to go through it. But, and, and of course, ask questions as you go. But if you have a clean install, for example, you don't have a large, um, humongous environment that you need to migrate or would like to consider to come in into cloud cloud, but you just really have maybe one or two servers or maybe you know, a dozen servers that you want to bring in, um, the expectation would be this. Um, work with your, your customer delivery person and build a service request. Now, um, the requesting for a service is typical, as, as you might know when you engage OTEC, we always say, let's build a service request. Um, that takes about, oh, maybe a week um, once you submit it to have that service request in, you know, and put into our system. We have some very simple intake forms that you would work with your account lead to, to fill out that describes what your tenant space might look like. And does everybody understand when we talked about portal, what that portal is? Does, before I go on any further, um, I just want to describe it for you. So. When I'm talking about tenant space and CalCloud, what I'm talking about is building the, the website that you would go to to provision a server. So what this process is, is to build that website for you to start provisioning a server. So you go through uh, the first five days, you build the service request or business days, first five business days. And then we would engage with you, your, your account lead and the CalCloud team and your technical staff to go through a subscription meeting. And what I mean by that is, we're going to have a conversation. And that conversation is going to say, you know, I want to stand up servers in CalCloud. This is my network diagram. This is how we connect to the state network now and how you might expect to connect to any applications that you might have in CalCloud. So if you're wondering, well, how, how would I have work with my organization? There's different ways you can build your servers. You can have an inward facing server that's, that you could build maybe a VPN or VRF2 using CGEN, or you have an outward web service servers like um, Rob mentioned for his organization. Um, and we would build that tenant space so you can configure those types of business solutions in, in CalCloud. After we build that, that subscription, we determine what your requirements is, it takes about 21 days and calendar days to build the tenant space. We work with IBM, AT&T, like David said, and we build out your whole environment so when we turn over the keys to you, you're ready to start. So in, in terms of time, if we're looking today and you say to your account manager, hey, I want to get on CalCloud, how long would it take? It'll take about a month. So you know, from the time that you submit the service request until we turn over the keys and do some training. Now at the end of that CalCloud tenant space that I'm talking about, we will train you. And that's where some of the training that Chris was mentioning about we will offer. And that training is, you know, what does the website look like? How do I get to my servers after I request one? Um, how do I provision additional resources? How do I take resources away? Or maybe you want to have um, a build a different VLAN or such. So they, it basically gives you the ability to know how to use the portal. Now, has anybody gone to GoDaddy here? All right, Amazon, right? They all have web portals, and it's all wonderful. And, and you know, you sit there with your credit card, and you're, you're saying to yourself, okay, well, I'll give that credit card to my application developer. Go ahead and build me a server. Now, would you like to do that? I was an app developer. I would. <laughs> but you know what? You probably don't want to do that because you want you, as your organization grows, you want to make sure that 
you know, the, the app developer's manager approves your build, or the ISO looks at your build to make sure it's right. Or maybe you, the people who hold the purse strings and money give you the, the, the go ahead before you actually pull the trigger to build. Our tenant space gives you that level of authority. So as you go through and navigate our portal, just know we have considered your business issues. A lot of state departments um, may look at the portal of Go, GoDaddy or Amazon's and think, yeah, they can provision pretty quickly, but they don't have that built-in con inherent controls that we do in our portal. And that's really a good business business model for us, for our customers, because you know we understand you have to have all the appropriate checks and balances before we provision anything. So that's happening at the training, and then once you get that training, um, you're going to be able to stand up a server immediately. So I'm, I said about you know 21 or, or a full month to get your um, access to the portal. Um, how long does it take to provision a server after that is done? That same day. Once we give you the keys and the training, you can start provisioning and build your server that day. How long will it take to, for that server to be stood up? About 28 to 45 minutes, depending on what the complexity of the server, whether you're doing Linux or you're doing Windows. So how many of you have interfaced with OTEC to build servers? Okay, so, and I'm not disparaging my, my OTEC, I'm part of a group. It takes a long time if we do it for you. We're giving you the control. We're giving you the keys to do that on your behalf at your own time and pace to build your servers out quickly. So we're, we're speeding up that rapid application design. We're helping you build that quick infrastructure for you to do the business work you need to get done. So um, the one last piece that I have, and you probably can't tell on the end of this diagram, is firewall rules. So Rob mentioned, and I, and I, I kind of said yay to myself, is yeah, at the end, we're not taking away control of firewalls. You have to work with your ISO office. You have to work with your application managers to make sure whatever ports you make available to the public or interfacing or inward facing that uh, firewall rules are implemented correctly and with the right authorization. The portal does give you that. So, you, but that doesn't take away time. So, once you request it from OTEC, it takes about five business days. So, in, in a complete model, when you're looking at from beginning SR to very end, we're talking about a month and five days when it's completely done um, for you to have your servers up with the appropriate ports open and all that. So, um, I know you're probably thinking if you haven't seen the portal yet, how does that, what does that mean to me if I want to add extra servers? Well, as you go through the portal and we teach you how to provision servers, you'll, you'll know how quickly it can be done, and it is pretty quick. So with that said, these are the onboarding steps I was kind of alluding to. The, we start with, one, the service request. We do our subscription meeting. We do our portal subscription. So the portal subscription is the training. We're giving you the keys. We're showing you how to use it. You're learning where do you, um, how do you get into your server environment. And um, basically, you start provisioning then. You are billed on a daily basis using the monthly rate, which means the pay-as-you-go model is strictly true. So you can bring up a quick app application or a, a test server, test it out and see, well, um, I don't like this server. I want to take it down. Then we're only going to bill you for the time it's up. And your ability to request for it to be taken down, again, like we provision, is within the day. So anyway, um, in the back of the room, I have a small business card. Um, really, this is, card isn't for me, but it's the link to find out who your account lead is. So if you're here today and you don't know who your person is, um, just pick up one of these cards They're in the back, and that's where we'll have the brochures today. And um, you can quickly find who your account lead, my peer, would be. But in, anyway, I'm here on behalf of uh, customer delivery because I'm the service agent for customer delivery. So a lot of my peers come to me for technical questions or how to work with our customers to onboard. Um, I'll be available at the end of the, the, conference, the session today if you want to talk to me directly. Uh, but I thank you for your time. And I hope uh, today I know David's topic was very important for many of uh, you here. And I'm glad that you were able to come. So thank you very much. I want to turn this over to um, Chris Cruz and Rob. Okay, very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. So before we adjourn, any final questions of the panel or what you heard today or any additional information that you want us to provide? Questions in the audience or, or through the webcast? 
Yes. Hi, I'm with the uh, Department of Social Services and Information Security. One of our biggest issues doesn't seem to be addressed by this, which is um, storage, sharing, you know, everybody goes to Google or uh, Windows or Amazon or whatever to put files up there and take them home. And we need a, a, a way to do that within state within the state system so we can get them off of those. We can't inventory the information. We can't, we're, we're having trouble preventing it and, and I'm not seeing any solution for that. One of our panel members. Yeah, yeah uh, take that? I, I think I can address it. I think what you're talking about is some sort of, of collaborative storage that your staff can use to share files and it is on. Oh, I'm just not close enough, I'm sorry. Um, co collaborative uh, uh, file sharing within your staff and they're tending to send it up to Google or other services like that. Um, I, Chris may be able to address this uh, directly, but it's my understanding that there is an effort uh, within the Department of Technology and with agencies to look at how we provide collaborative file sharing as a service for the state. So it is being investigated, and I don't know if you have anything you want to add, Chris. Yeah, I think, you know, through our O365 services, and one of the things we can do, I know, as we work to address Microsoft moving forward is looking at collaboration services and how we're going to handle that on an enterprise effort. So hopefully we'll have... We'll have some clarity for you. So one of the things we're trying to do with Microsoft is once we can move forward on a negotiated agreement with Microsoft on CES, then we're going to start having that dialogue with the community. So that's going to happen as soon as we can get that done. So I promise you we'll, we'll address that with SharePoint and O365 and how we're going to handle collaboration moving forward. So that's a good question, though, and I understand the sense of urgency. Any other questions for us? Yes. Do we have any actual DR customers yet? So, yeah, Greg, you want to take that? Yeah, we have about uh, seven or eight <laughs> DR customers. We have, I know one of them is uh, SCO, um, and we're scheduling a, a DR exercise tentatively right now for the October timeframe. So. Uh, this is Rob. Um, we also at CDFA are looking at DR as an option through CalCloud. Any other questions from the panel or for me? Yes. What's the, the longer term strategy, the five, ten year strategy to support Cal Cloud? Um, is, are you guys planning to transition support to the state? Um, do you guys anticipate vendor support long term? Well, I think that's something we really need to look at with adoption and how it goes right now. Obviously, we have IBM as a partnership, and, and as we mature through these processes and look at that, I'm sure that we'll continue to reevaluate that at a future stage, but that's a good question. But. We'll be in the evaluation process and see how it goes right now with the partnership that we have with IBM and then look at our internal resources to see if that's something we want to transition to. Morning, Chris. Hey, good morning, uh, Gary. Is there any effort to enhance security services, for, especially for departments that aren't as mature as the larger ones? Because a lot of the recent attacks um, that have been occurring usually hit the smaller departments, and then once they're within the inter internal state system then everybody else has to deal with it right i think that's a good point one of the things we're doing and i think uh, mr langston mentioned this is the vendor subscription service we have with at&t and the uh, security compliance that we're trying to achieve with cal cloud we're also moving forward at the department of technology within otec of looking at a security operations center to address what you're talking about so we're hoping that we can take this subscription service with at&t further flush it out to cover all areas where we can add and reinforce further security mechanisms so we're covering the medium and small departments so that was part of the plan of bringing in the subscription service so we developed a bcp around that to bring the right resources in to move down that road and so that's the direction we're going so i'm sure you'll hear more about that as um, we get the subscription service and SIM set up about what those next steps are. But, yeah, that's, that's where we're trying to go from an enterprise perspective. All right, any other questions for us? Great questions, by the way. Well, anyway, I wanted to thank everybody for coming. I uh, also wanted to thank Rob Schmidt as our change champion, and also for the use of the facility today and, and his group for really talking about their case study and how they're using this, and also the Cal Cloud team for their extraordinary work in making this happen. So I promise there's going to be more communication to come on the things that we've laid out today. And, um, you know, we're all in this boat together to make Cal Cloud successful. So thanks again. Really appreciate that. Have a great day.